I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Hi, I'm Reverend Ken Blanchard, and welcome to the Speak Life Church podcast. This show is dedicated to you in hopes of encouraging your spirit, feeding your faith, and blessing your life. Proverbs 18, 21. How are you doing? It's so good to have you back. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, eternal God, creator of the heaven and the earth. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we stop right now. We pause for a moment. We bow our heads. We close our eyes. We meditate and think about all the goodness that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord God, for life itself. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of everything we've done. Contrary to your will, whether we did it in open or in secret, because nothing is hidden from you. Father, we ask that you would cleanse us right now and allow us to hear from you as this podcast goes on. Touch in a mighty way. Heal in a mighty way. Allow your people to feel your presence right now. Father, somebody asked me to pray for them. They have some back issues. Somebody has having a problem at home. Somebody's fighting some depression. Somebody's fighting themselves. Somebody's fighting their spouse. Somebody's fighting for a job. Somebody's fighting for their life, Lord God. I ask that you would help them as only you can. Step in right now, Lord God. Ease pain. Allow them to know that it's you that stopped it. It's you that's in charge. It's you that they should be seeking. Answer that prayer, Lord God, that's unspoken the one who's wondering if you're there. I thank you, Lord God, for answering prayer. I thank you, Lord God, for hearing your servant. I thank you, Lord God, for your blessing. I thank you for all that you've done for me in the past, all that you're doing for me right now, and all that's coming in the future. I bless your name, Lord God. There is no one like you. You've kept me for a mighty long time. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise? How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, in your favor towards your people. Visit me with your salvation, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have behaved wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his own name, that he might make his power known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up, and he led them through the deeps as through the wilderness. So he saved them from the hand of the one who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. Father, help us like you helped those in Israel. You are the same today and tomorrow. You were the same then, the same mighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-loving God. This is your servant's prayer, Lord God. I ask that you would bless this time of us together. Let everybody who hears my voice be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Pretty long prayer, wasn't it? Yeah, I know, because I got a lot to be thankful for. Remember how I asked how the mic was? Sounds like a rap song where the guy goes, my mic sounds nice, check one. Well, actually, I found out that I had some stuff. All I had to do was just hook it up. May the night the mic sound even better. So thank you, Lord, for the gift. Thank you for being here. We're talking about the book of Revelation, John, the revelator. Remember that? And we're talking about Pergamum, which is hard to say sometimes, but there's some big tongue twisters in this scripture. 
and I didn't quite finish it, so I'm going to go back to it and end the chapter of talking about Pergamum before we hit Thyatira. Okay? I want you to take, um, before we go there, just notice that speaklifechurch.net got a uh, facelift. And please go and visit it. And if you could, join our member section so I can reach out to you later. And you can read the show notes, which also we have. But I'll talk about that more later. Speaklifechurch.net All right, let's get into it. Last week we talked about the Church of Pergamum, and I ain't done yet. I mean, actually, we could stay on each church for weeks and weeks if I were to dig into some of the notes and the notebooks and the books and the class notes and all that stuff that I have. So let's continue on with the Church of Pergamum before we cross over unto uh, the Church of Thyatira in chapter 2, verse 18 through 29. So we're still in Pergamum for this week. A part of this um, text talks about the nature of Christ. It says, these are the words of him who has the sharp and double-edged sword. Now, you previously heard me say that Christ selected one of the aspects of his nature as revealed to John in his vision and presented it to each individual church. To Pergamum, he revealed, quote, the, sor- the sharp double-edged sword, which without question refers to the word of God. The cure for the problem of the local church at Pergamum, of the Pergamum age of the church or of any church, is the word of God. Christ used that word to sanctify his church in John 17, 17, to clean it in 15, verse 3, to bring it joy in 15, 11, and to bring it peace in 16, verse 33. Had the church of Pergamum and that Pergamum age heeded the word of God, the evils of the dark ages could well have been avoided. So what were these ages of Pergamum? It's basically from 600 A.D. to 300 A.D., just in case you forgot. What was his commendation to the church of Pergamum? Well, it's in verse 13, and it falls into three basic categories. I know where you live, yet you remain true to my name. And what else did he say? You did not renounce your faith in me. Yeah, those were his three things that he commended this church on. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. We've already seen the evil nature of the city where Satan made his headquarters, which later was moved to Rome. From there, Satan directed the affairs of his worldwide kingdom, perverting the souls of human beings. Through the Roman emperors, as we have already heard, Satan had learned from the first three centuries that attacking Christians would never conquer this. So he changed his approach during the Pergamum period to one of indulgence and elation, or elevation, that's a better word. You see, lift, look, lift up certain people and they just forget what they went through which might answer some questions. The second part was you remain true to my name. Criticism cannot be hurled against the doctrine of this church or the church age for they were doctrinal pure, Um, but they sinned by taking in the ceremonies of paganism, which later were supposed and supported by um, artificial doctrines of unscriptorial nature that went on to pollute the true doctrines of the church. It was during this time that there was a guy called Arian, A-R-I-A-N, who fought at the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. Arius and his followers denied the personal deity of Christ. And actually, their concept of Christ was much like that of modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses. Christ was the greatest of all created beings, but not one with the Father. And at this council, presided over by Constantine himself, this question inspired heated debates. It must have seemed strange indeed for a governmental leader to preside over a Christian assembly, while at the same time bearing the title of previous emperors, namely high priest of the heathen religions. Dr. H. A. Ironside, in his book Lectures on the Book of Revelation, tell this story. 
During the council, feelings ran so high that Constantine had to intervene on several occasions, and at one point, the brilliant Arius seemed almost to have stopped all opposition. When a hermit from the deserts of Africa, he wrote, sprang to his feet, clad chiefly in tiger skin, this latter he tore from his back, disclosing great scars, the result of having been thrown into the arena among the wild beasts. With his back dreadfully disfigured by animal claws exposing to their view, he dramatically cried, These are the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I cannot hear this blasphemy. Then he proceeded to give so stirring an address, setting forth clearly the truth as to Christ's eternal deity, that the majority of the council realized in a moment that it was indeed the voice of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Ironside continues, Whether the story be actually true or not, I cannot say, but it well sets forth the spirit pervading many who participated in the council, most of whom had passed through the terrible persecution of Diocletian. The final outcome of the Council of Nicaea was that Jesus Christ was declared to be, quote, very God of very God, perfection of perfection, and, quote, God and man in one person. Because this church held fast to Christ's name, the organized church did not teach anything but the personal deity of Jesus Christ for over a thousand years. Not until rationalism came in and produced 19th and 20th century modernism could the church be found guilty of a false doctrine regarding our Lord. The devil did succeed in subverting this teaching by making it merely a dogmatic doctrine rather than a vital relationship with a person. Most so-called Christian churches today just pay lip service to the deity of Christ. Third point about the commendation to Pergamum. You did not renounce your faith in me. Much of this has already been covered related to the doctrinal purity of this church and church age. The Antipas, referred to in verse 13, is unknown by biblical scholars and is suggested that he was a local Christian in the city of Pergamum who had, like many during the first century, sealed the testimony of his faith with his own blood. You know, this condemnation of Christ given to the church of Pergamum reveals that Although their theological doctrine was correct, their practical doctrines were radically evil. These false doctrines fell into two main categories. And as is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 14 of Revelation, Nevertheless, I have few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. This doctrine of Balaam, I spell B-A-L-A-A-M, um, to properly kind of get to know what this is talking about, you have to like know what happened in Numbers 22 through 31. In short, this dude named Balaam tried to, for filthy lucre's sake to prophesy a curse against Israel. Balak, the king of Moab, was afraid of the children of Israel as they were coming through this land. So he hired this dude to use his gift of prophecy against Israel. And Balaam sought every means at his disposal to make it happen. But he ran into a, a small problem. God. Every time Balaam opened his mouth to curse them, out came a blessing. And then finally, in desperation, he gave Balak the suggestion of enticing the Israelites to making an unholy alliance with the Moabites through intermarriage with them. Thus we find fulfilled what is referred to in Revelations 2.14. Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. At Balaam's suggestion, the Israelites intermarried with the Moabites, contrary to the will of God. Thus the people were polluted socially and spiritually. The only way to deal with paganism and false doctrines is to condemn them and root them out. Paul's advice to the Colossian church in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 8, is most appropriate in, so, in such cases. Let me tell you about um, false gods and pagans and stuff. In my early years, before I was ordained, before I sought to become a minister, I was very, very curious about this God thing. Why does everybody re re kind of like um, worship something? And is it all the same guy and does this have different names and the answer is no 
folks are worshiping everything. And I went on this trek, kind of like um, the guy from Kung Fu, on this trek with my flute to just learn about how people worship. So I went to different churches. And I can tell you one thing. The churches that don't worship God have the finest women in it. The sexiest chicks are in the most devilish places. But I digress. This was typical of the church of Pergamum in that although the believers that were faithful to Christ's name and held the faith regardless of the doctrine did not remain separated from the world, but they kind of went with the paganism. Paganism soon predominated as it always does. The only time Christians have the unlimited power of the Holy Spirit at their disposal is when they are obedient to the will of God. When they dis- disobey God and make alliances with the world, they are entering into a powerless state that will enmesh and ruin them. You can't be one foot in and one foot out. You can't be dabbling in the occult or astrology or horoscopes or numerology or all the stuff, zodiac signs, which is all witchcraft, believe it or not. Nobody says that. Astrology, numerology, rocks, tarot cards, uh, you name it, it's all witchcraft. So if you think that the two of you can dwell in the same body, you are wrong. I'll just pause for effect there because somebody needed to hear that. Horoscopes, zodiac signs, uh, numerology, pagan stuff, the occult, it's all witchcraft. And then finally, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We talked about that once. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans has already been explained under the Church of Ephesus, right? We talked about it. Nicolaitanism is the doctrine of a strong ecclesiastical hierarchy ruling over the laity. And this has never been conducive to a strong spiritual condition in the church. Lay people were given no voice in church affairs but were required to obey blindly the decrees of the clergy. The clergy then gradually seemed to gravitate to a more impractical ivory tower type of existence that separated them more and more from the people. Whenever clergy lose contact with people, they cease to be effective tools for the hand of God. The Lord Jesus gave his opinion about these hierarchical systems of church government when he referred to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans as that which I also hate. In Revelation 2, 6, this teaching has ruined more churches and denominations than any other. You know, when it comes to the counsel of Christ to the church of Pergamum, it's just a simple statement of basic principle that reduced to this bare minimum means repent or be judged by the word of God. This principle, which has never been changed, applies to both individuals and churches. Unless we You get me? Unless we are willing to repent of our sins or our violations of the stated word of God and return in obedience to the word, we will be judged by the word. The double-edged sword talks about that. Be sure of this. If there is a principle in the word of God to which you have refused to submit yourself in this life, you will face that principle when you stand before him at his coming. So it's better to heed the word of God in 1 Corinthians 11, 31, where it says, but if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Thus guaranteeing that we will hear the master's well done, good and faithful servant, as said in Matthew 25, 21, instead of his condemnation. Our Lord's challenge to the church of Pergamum is directed to overcomers, as it says in 1 John 5, verse 4, and is divided into two beautiful symbols loaded with meaning, hidden manna and a white stone. What in the world is the hidden manna and a white stone? I'm glad you asked. The hidden manna is a symbol that is readily understood by the Bible student. Manna was the heavenly food sent by God to the children of Israel in the desert. Remember that? It typifies the spiritual food provided by God in his word. It should be clearly understood that this is an individual feeding, not a church function. Just as the Israelites had to go individually and gather the manna in the desert, 
So does the child of God in the Pergamum church age or any church age is dependent on God for his or her individual spiritual supply. No matter what's going on, no matter what your dilemma, if God's children will only look to him, their needs will be supplied. Remember what it says in Philippians 4, verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. All right, so that white stone is symbolic and not so easy to determine as the hidden manna. Scholars are actually agreed on this subject, though there is a basic tone of agreement and that of assurance. White in the Bible refers to the righteousness of God, and that's why all the supremacists always jump on that one. But in this connection, I think of the ancient custom as being the key that unlocks the meaning of this stone. It seems that in ancient times, a white stone meant acquittal. For example, if a man had been tried by a court, the jurors published their vote on his case by laying down a white stone, signifying that they were acquitting him of the crime. This would certainly be in accord with many other passages in Scripture that indicate that Christ was given an acquittal to the child of God who has called on him for forgiveness and salvation. Like in Romans 5.1, where you're justified through faith. The big difference, of course, is that we are guilty. Nevertheless, because Christ died guiltless, we received the white stone of acquittal with a name for Christ on it that is yet unknown to us. The white stone then stands as a beautiful symbol of the eternal acquittal we gain through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that concludes all of that Pergamum stuff so that next week we can talk about Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 29 which will cover the church of Thyatira or Thyatira, depending on where you're from. You know, there's a misconception that Christianity, like all religions, is based on myth and legend. Form critics, and I put that in italicies, approach the biblical text with the assumption that the passages must be understood in terms of literary form, such as poetry or song or dialogue or the epistles. During the 20th century, these form critics increasingly assumed that the Gospels were heavily dependent on other sources, traditions, orally, or you know, possibly even hearsay evidence about Jesus the Christ. Now, while recognition of literary forms within the Bible does not necessarily represent a bad thing, the Scriptures do contain different literary styles. See, problems arise when it's assumed that the New Testament text we have today simply represent the most current compilation of previous fragments of indeterminate credibility. We should not take it for granted that the gospel represented numerous cycles of amplification, revision, and reinterpretation by, quote, the early church. But what critics don't understand or seem to overlook when they claim that Christianity is based on folklore, legends, tales, myths, and parables is that normally the accumulation of such folklore among people, takes many generations. It's a gradual process spread over centuries of time. The gospel, the gospel, were produced and collected within little more than one generation. Even archaeological studies have proven this. As Paul M. Meyer, professor of ancient history in Western Michigan University once noted, quote, Arguments that Christianity hatched this Easter myth over a lengthy period of time or that the sources were written many years after the event are simply not factual, end quote. C.S. Lewis, you know that guy, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He was a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature back in the day from Cambridge University. He said, if a critic tells me that something in a gospel is legend or romance, I want to know how many legends and romances he has read. How well his palate is trained in detecting them by the flavor. Not how many years he has spent on that gospel. I have been reading poems, romances, vision, literature, legends, myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know not one of them. The gospels is like this. And while we're journeying through here free of charge, Another misconception about Christianity is that it's based on a blind faith. There are people who operate under the assumption that Christianity is based on 
just believing, not having anything to back it up. That's not true. As Josh McDowell noted, Christianity is uniquely factual faith based on indisputable facts. Theologian Clark Pinnock also stated that the facts backing the claims of Christ are the cognitive, informative facts upon which all historical, legal, and ordinary decisions are based. Many people want to apply one standard to test um, the secular literature and another to the Bible. The literature under investigation, whether secular or religious, should be held to the same standards and test. As McDowell notes, compared with other ancient writings, the Bible has more manuscript evidence to support it than any ten pieces of classical literature combined. Oddly enough, it is the scientific world that is increasingly given the greatest and most shocking evidence in favor of God's existence. The Christian faith is objective and factual, not blind. And then we'll just continue with this all next week. We'll talk about science. If science can't prove it, then it must not be true. I'm trying to give you a little bit of um, apologetics every every week because you asked for it. All right, I got the okay from about four or five of you that uh, you would like a Zoom where we can actually see each other and talk and pray and uh, and carry on like people of God should. So I'm going to make that happen. And I will be sending you out emails as soon as I do. But I think I'm going to, have to make a link so that um, you can sign up if you have never emailed me before and I don't have your email address. So look for a link in the show notes today. So if you can remember that, go to speaklifechurch.net. The site has been revamped. There is a new link to sign up. And just check out, you can check out the show notes from now on. Yeah, we got somebody working on our show notes. Praise the Lord. And um, the site's looking pretty good. If you'd like to contribute to the website through a Christian article or something motivating or inspirational, Send it on this way to pastor at speaklifechurch.net. And if you go to speaklifechurch.net now, there is a subscribe button on the widget side, on the right-hand side of the screen, where you will get um, the latest notes that are on the website sent to you. And we'll work on doing a newsletter. Y'all going to make me work. Doggone it. (laughs) Thanks again to Sarah for such beautiful transcriptions. You know, this year and this year of the corona, everybody's going crazy and uh, we got fires burning the whole West Coast. There's hurricanes and flooding in our Gulf states. There is um, hurricanes and water coming up the East Coast. And we haven't even got to the fall yet, which happens this week, according to the calendar. It's a good time, not not counting the smoke and uh, other things. I think we had snow also in Colorado already to get closer to the one who makes all this stuff so that when the beast of pestilence, when the plague comes near your dwelling that you are covered, it's not only a good insurance policy, it's common sense. If you have a chance to be saved, wouldn't you want to be? If you get a chance to live in peace in the midst of craziness, wouldn't you want to be? If you don't understand What's going on and what's coming next? Wouldn't you want to talk to the one who knows? It just makes sense to me. This 2020 has been a good time for me personally. I've had a chance to slow down and uh, speak and stay in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes it's not a cool thing because I get... um... Let me tell you about God. He is so good, so clean, so perfect, so miraculous, so wonderful. The adjectives don't do him justice. That when you are close to him, you see how jacked up you are. You get to see all your imperfections. And I think that's happening more and more to you. If you are sitting there and you've been praying and all of a sudden you start thinking about God and your heart gets right, your mind gets right, your spirit gets right. Then the Holy Spirit moves closer to you. And when that happens, you see all your imperfections. All of a sudden, you see how of a hot mess you really are. And then you start thinking, because your brain is still working, that, man, I am unworthy. I am unclean. And it's the same thing that the prophets said 
in the presence of God. You don't notice how dirty you are, how naked you are until God is there. And like you told Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were unclean? He knows, loves you anyway. Let's pray. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Heavenly Father, we ask for growth. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing me that as I desire and drink the sincere milk of your word, I will grow spiritually. All scripture has been given by your inspiration, and I want to live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. I will study your word so that I will never be ashamed because I will know how to rightly divide your word of truth. As I walk in the light of your word, I will meditate upon your precepts and give myself totally to them. Speaking the truth in love, I will grow up into Christ in all things. Father, I deeply desire to fully know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, so that I will be filled with all your fullness. There are so many things that I am unworthy of. I thank you for loving me, for caring for me, for taking care of me, for forgiving me, for getting me through tomorrow. Father, please forgive me, forgive us for everything we've done contrary to what you would have us to do and to be. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. Father, feed the spirit in me so that I may be full, so that my joy will be full. So that I can look at the same storm, the same picture, the same tornado, the same destruction and see your beauty, see your peace. Feel your presence in the midst of the flames. Nobody says that in this life we're going to have it easy because we're a Christian. But you told us to be of good cheer. Because you have overcome this world. Thank you for helping me grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. To him be glory forevermore. Thank you for everyone listening to my voice. Thank you for everyone that knows your name and is praying for this church, for this ministry, for their family, for this country. Bless you, Heavenly Father. In the name of your son, Jesus, which is above every name, we pray. Amen. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless all that our ears have heard and our spirit has felt. May the grace of you, Lord God, rest, rule, and abide with us both now and forevermore until that great getting up morning when there will be no sunset and no dawning. Speak life, family, church, and friends. I'll look for you at the feet of Jesus. Until then, or next week, God bless.